Good afternoon and welcome to the How to Monitor for Key Pests and Beneficials webinar, which is part of the Strategic Farm Week. My name is Richard Meredith and I'll be your chair today. Just before we get into things, I'm going to run us through the, the housekeeping for, for today's webinar. Um, there's, there's, um, we can't hear any of you, everybody's muted, so don't, so don't worry about that. There's a questions box on the right hand side of your screen. If you've got any burning questions, please feel free to, to ask them as we go through through the webinar. We'll be stopping for sh short breaks in, in, in amongst things to ask our speakers questions and we'll take a bit of time at the end to have any discussion points then. The main content of the webinar aims to go on to speak for about an hour and then we've got the another 30 minutes of time for discussion um, if, if needs be. This is recorded, so if you do miss anything or would like any further information, then it will be up on the HDB YouTube website at the end of the day. So this is all part of Strategic Farm Week and we're on day two. Yesterday we had all the videos of all the, um, the trials, the hosts and the, the people that are involved, involved in, um, in all the trials that go out on the Strategic Farms. Today, Tuesday, is all about the, the how-to um, webinars covering off lessons coming out of the strategic farms. This morning we had um, how to, to monitor monitor your crops. Obviously we're looking at how to, to monitor to pest monitor your pests at the moment. And then this evening at seven o'clock um, there's a how to reduce your inputs with um, Tim Parton, Simon Cowell, David Aglin, who's the new Scottish monitor farmer, and Brian Parker, who's the, the strategic farmer um, from the east. Strategic farmer, I beg your pardon. So there's lots going on this week. Um, tomorrow we've got the, the podcast being released. We've got Paul Temple, our chair of AHDB, interviewing the, the three strategic farmers. And then Thursday, there's another another day of um, webinars. And I'll and I'll sum all those up at the end of end of this here so you can see where to go. There are basis and Neroso points available for, for the webinars. Um, there's two points for, for basis. And our, and our application to Neroso is currently pending, but we hope to get some points. If you'd like to, to enter your Neroso or basis number, date of birth and your postcode, then we can file those for you at the end of the webinar. Right, so the content for today. I'm just gonna run you through the, the agenda. We're gonna do some quick introductions and then we'll hand over to the Strategic Farm West host, Rob Fox. So to kick these things off, my name is Richard Meredith, um, so I head up the, the Arable Knowledge Exchange team at AHDB. It's my great honour to, to host this, um, to, to chair this webinar with you today. I'm next going to ask um, our, our main speaker, Mark Ramston from ADAS, just to introduce himself and tell us a bit about, about what he does, and then we'll go over to Emily. Mark, over to you. Uh, so I'm Mark Ramston, I'm an entomologist working at ADAS uh, in our crop protection team. Uh, and my fa main focus is on integrated pest management, um, but my background's really in uh, promoting beneficial insects, so uh, things that are out helping to control some of the pests on arable and, uh, and other crops. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for all the effort you put into, into getting everything ready for today in this new world. This, we're all learning about these webinars and, and online meetings, and it's been a bit of a journey, so thank you very much for all the efforts. Um, Emily, Emily Pope, my colleague at AHDB. Emily, are you there? Would you like to just introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, hi, everybody. So, as Richard said, my name's Emily Pope. I work um, at HDB as a Senior Knowledge Transfer Manager. Uh, my role really is to work between the research teams and the regional knowledge exchange teams. So, a lot of my job involves coordinating on-farm trials across our strategic farm programmes and also our monitor farm programme. Thank you, Emily. So we'll come over to Rob Fox in a, in a moment, but just to run you through how, how we're going to structure this today. Rob Fox is the strategic farmer for, for, for the West of England, and he's been looking at beneficials and, and, and natural enemies um, as part of his, his strategic farm program. Um, so Rob's going to introduce himself and just going to give a bit of background about what he's doing, why he's doing it and where he's at. And then we're going to hand over to, to Mark. Um, Mark has been heavily involved in the in the design and the the implementation of the trials at at Rob's. So he'll be bringing some life and looking at why do we measure, what do we measure, and, and all the kind of the the associated points. And then finally, we're going to hand over to to Emily. Emily will show talk about the HDB tools and resources that that we have and there for you to use as a levy pair. So without any further ado, I will hand over to to to, um, to, to Robert 
to Rob, sorry, beg your pardon, very formal, um, hand over to Rob to introduce himself and um, run us a bit through what he's doing on his, on his farm. Rob, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, would have been lovely to have you all here on the farm uh, today, but obviously uh, the current situation we're in unfortunately doesn't allow that. So yeah, my name's uh, Rob Fox. For those of you that have never uh, met me before, um, we, I'm the farm manager at um, the Evans family just outside Leamington Spa in Warwickshire. We're farming a thousand acres, all combinable crops on some quite varied grade three uh, clays. Um, we're about 900 acres cropped and, and then we're also part of a larger 1800 acre uh, sort of machinery and labour share joint venture, which I set up um, about six years ago. So, um, to talk about this subject relevant to um, my farm, the farm I manage, um, like I said, we are um, quite a basic combinable crop uh, farm growing wheat, barley, winter and spring barley sometimes, oilseed rape sometimes, not at the moment, um, spring beans, um, and then a few uh, niche crops um, every now and then when we can. Um, so we're sort of under the same pressure from various uh, various little blighters as as uh, most uh, combinable crops are. Um, in the autumn, obviously, uh, wheat uh, and oilseed rape under pressure from um, slugs. We all know the issues we've had with that recently. Actives, uh, well, metaldehyde firstly going, now coming back, um, but, but more than likely at some point in the future losing that again. Um, on the oilseed rape front, obviously flea beetle um, has become more and more of an issue for us um, over the last three or four years. Um, for harvest 19, we lost about 50% of our oilseed rape due to both adult pressure and, uh, and then larvae in the spring where we thought we'd made it through. And um, this year, we actually wrote off all of our oilseed rape. Um, some of it down to very dry and then very wet conditions as well, but um, flea beetle doing their bit to help finish that off. Um, obviously, aphids a concern in cereals and oilseed rape throughout um, throughout the year. As I mentioned earlier on, flea beetle larvae um, after the adult pressure in the in the in the autumn, the larvae pressure in the in the spring. Uh, bean weevil, uh, we grow uh, spring beans in our rotation. Um, so we do see a lot of bean weevil. Uh, some years it's it's manageable without spraying. This year in particular, it's been pretty bad, probably due to the slightly warmer weather we've had since um, since planting. Um, other beetle issues in oilseed rape through the year when we're growing it. Midge issue in oilseed rape when we're growing it. Brooked beetle in in spring beans. Um, Aphids again in later cereals, uh, later drilled cereals, and um, potentially orange blossom midge um, in um, in wheat crops um, as well. So yeah, we're under. Um, it's quite interesting when you list it out like that. There's uh, a lot more come to mind, um, and you can see why uh, people are using insecticides. Um, we have to try and protect these crops as we go forward. Rob, I've got a quick question to, to kind of yeah. insert for you there. Obviously, today, this the focus of this webinar is kind of um, how to, to monitor for, for these pests. How much would you currently, where would you say you are on the spectrum of, of, of kind of in your monitoring at the moment? Have you got more to do or do you do you feel like kind of where, where are you at now? Where would you pitch yourself in what you are doing? Um, is, there, is, there, is there a journey that you're going to go on? Um, I... I'm facts and basis qualified, so I do uh, a lot of the crop walking here uh, myself over all three farms that we're involved with. Um, we have an agronomist for strategic advice. Um, so I'm, this time of year, as most um, involved managers are, I'm out every day in, in, in various crops. I like to walk a couple of hours every day, um, keeping an eye on things, keeping an eye on thresholds, what we should and shouldn't be doing, but not only monitoring um, the issues that we've got, but also trying to keep an eye on what beneficials are around, and if we were to take the decision to spray, what impact that would have 
on the wider biodiversity, not just on the actual um, problem in hand. So I'd like to think I'm um, I'm fairly involved here and fairly up to speed with um, with the levels that we've got. Thank you. So um, regarding the trial, the relevant trial that we've got on the strategic farm um, at the moment, um, we're looking at the impact of uh, flowering strips, um, both the, uh, down the, the side of fields as well as uh, in the middle of the field. Um, there is some theory that uh, if, if you can if you can have a flowering strip every sort of hundred meters through the crop, um, then um, the beneficials will come out 50 meters either side of that, and therefore you've got this hundred meter um, sort of um, area within the field um, or in between the strips where the beneficials are more active. So the trial is laid out as you can uh, hopefully see on the sh on, on the screen. Uh, Three fields. One is a control field, so no margins on that field. It's just being monitored for the levels of beneficials um, where we wouldn't have um, any flowering margins. Um, the field at the very top of that map has um, uh, flowering margins down both of the long sides. Um, and then the field to the left of the map, um, um, and you can see in the photo there as well, has margins on the two um, the two ends of the fields and then within the field uh, around every 100 meters um, we have a six meter margin um, going straight down the middle of um, of the field so that's how it's laid out these are uh, flowering grass margins um, which were planted last spring and just really coming into their own now you can see the bottom picture that's one of the uh, one of the field edges on the um, um, on the field to the top of the map, um, really coming into its own now. Um, that was taken just a few um, a few days ago. So this is one of the longer term trials through the whole course of the six years of the strategic farm program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we're only in the second year of this. So. Um, we envisage um, a lot more data coming out of this um, as we move forward over the next next four years. Rob, I've had one one question come up looking for your opinion. I'm not going to use and mention any names, but in the press last week, it was suggested that um, there should be no insect spraying in the in the summer in the future, in the summer months. Do you agree with that, or or do you disagree? <sighs> uh that's a really difficult one to answer um i think in utopia yes it would be it would be lovely if we can get away from uh from using insecticides um and i think actually people are farmers are the more farmers i speak to are trying to move towards um no insecticide use certainly in in some crops if not in all um in all the crops that they're that they're growing would i want this enforced upon us um that's a really difficult one to answer you know everyone wants the option there to be able to go out and control a problem that's going to have an effect on yield um we have a lot of things enforced on us at the moment anyway can i see it coming yes probably uh, reduce insecticide use i think will be forced upon us in the future yeah last one before we move on what what would you say is the optimum width for flower or grass margins um in, in in terms of how the beneficials behave i don't know i certainly haven't got any information on um whether wider margins support a, a, a larger population per meter but certainly for us it's been trying to find something that fits in with um how we operate in the field um we're on a six meter drill so it made sense for us to have six meter margins uh, they fit in with the GPS tram lines, so um, we can manage the sprayer and the fertilizer sprayer fairly easily um, uh, to make sure that we're managing these margins um, ourselves. That's only a small field, it's only a seven hectare field, it's also got five oak trees in the middle of it, so I've really given myself a headache trying to get around that with the sprayer. Um, but yeah, I guess there are, um, I guess there is an argument for wider margins. Um, you can fit them into a larger field, um, but certainly multiplications of, of, of your width of, 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 of how you establish the crop, your drill, um, obviously makes sense. And do the strips in the in the field, the infield strips, do they do you get countryside stewardship payments from them? 
they're not currently in our um, in our countryside stewardship agreement. Um, I, I, uh, you caught me there. I would have to double check whether they can. I'm sure. I'm, I'm fairly confident they would they would be able to go into um, stewardship. And when you're laying out those strips, did you did you work it so that the boom end was against the strip, or do you shut off the section as the spray boom as it passes over? Um, it? So the on the on the one pass, the the outside six meters of the sprayer overlaps the strip, and then on the next pass, it's it's butted up against it. So it is a it's a six meter run within a six uh, a thirty meter um, uh, boom. If that makes sense. And do they need to connect to the to the margins, or, or do you just? Can you so, leave the uh, yeah, good question. When we set when we set this up, um, um, it, it, it was again it was a general consensus of how does it fit in with your system. I know other farms who are who are who are looking at this as well, where they've met the margins up at the edges. Um, effectively splitting a field like that into three smaller fields. I've decided not to do that. So there's a 12 meter run across the top, across the end of each of the strips um, so that we can, um, when we're establishing the headlands of the crop, we can still go around with the drill um, as normal, certainly for those two runs. Um, and indeed the, the headland tram line is, um, is within one of those runs as well. So we haven't met them up with the end, uh, with the end strip just to try and make management of the infield crop um, a bit more straightforward. Okay, thank you, thank you, Rob. Sorry, a bit of a grilling there at the end. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna we're now gonna hand over to, to to Mark Ramsden. Mark is from from ADAS. He's been heavily involved in in the work that Rob just described at the Strategic Farm. Um, Mark will be kind of taking us through the kind of the the hows, the what's, and the whys of of um, pests and natural enemies, and what what to monitor and, and why. Um, Mark, thank you very much, and without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, so I'm Mark Ramson, I'm an entomologist, as I said before, um, and I've been looking at some of the things we're finding on the strategic farms uh, this year. Um, just before I start on on what I was going to present, I just wanted to comment on a couple of those questions um, before we move on. Uh, one was about the uh, known sector size during the summer. Um, and it was just to say that if you're implementing an IPM strategy, your strategy would be to avoid insecticides um, anyway. And so it's more likely that that will be where we end up going, that, that there will be a more of a, a requirement that you have an IPM strategy to minimize applications rather than ever blanket banning anything. Um, because it, you probably find that you'll you'll find it easier to avoid using insecticides, particularly in the summer anyway. Um, the other point was about the width of margin. From a natural enemy point of view, the width of margin, whether it's four, six, ten meters, shouldn't make too much difference, um, providing you've got a good length of margin. Um, the width of margin is more important when it comes to managing. So if you've got a narrow margin and you have patches in the margin that aren't establishing as well, or if you get any drift or anything like that, um, and you've got a narrow margin, you just lose part of it more easily. Um, so they, they normally, it's normally advised that six meters is, is sort of the minimum to go for. So um, what I'm gonna do over the next 20 minutes is just cover uh, some of the ideas behind the work we're doing at um, on the strategic farms. Um, and also uh, summarize some of the things that you can do as uh, as part of your uh, IPM strategies on your farms as well, and how we can start to bring those things together. Um, and I just wanted to start with this this main point, which is that we know in in uh, biology uh, everything varies. We know there is that background variation um, that that is explained by lots of different factors around uh, around the environment. So even if we treated every field in exactly the same way, we'd still expect to find a lot of variation in the numbers and uh, types of insects we'd find in that field. And what we want to do is to uh, monitor and um, understand what's going on in the fields uh, with enough confidence that we can believe what, what actions we're taking is, is associated with different numbers of insects and, and different species rather than it just being part of that natural variation um, that we'd expect to see anyway. Um, and that's why monitoring has to be done in a certain way so we have that confidence uh, to make decisions and that you can have confidence that, in what you're doing. 
So it's next slide, Richard. Um, and really, that's that's the principles on which an IPM strategy is built. And IPM is really all about monitoring. And it's really important because to have a successful IPM strategy, uh, we we want to know that what the actions uh, of people are taking is based on actual numbers of pests in the crop rather than um, uh, expected numbers. And so monitoring really forms a, a core part of an IPM strategy. And um, what we've got uh, on this slide here are the eight principles of IPM as were outlined in uh, by the EU um, and monitoring is mentioned explicitly several times in that um, and it's all about trying to minimize the amount of pesticide applied not necessarily um, cutting it down to zero but just making sure that it's only being applied when it's really needed in accordance with uh, the numbers of pests seen in a crop uh, so Richard we can move on So what I've tried to do here is think about um, what we can measure and, and think fundamentally about what it is we're trying to achieve when we monitor different insects around the farm. And ultimately, is it's about giving confidence in your decisions. And you want to have confidence that you're minimizing your crop inputs, both in terms of what you're spending uh, and the amount of time you're spending, um, and you're maximizing your yield. And so I've kind of pulled out these five different levels of uh, actions that you can take. Um, so this starts off with forecasts that predict uh, when pests might be arriving in the crop, um, observations, so that's going and having a look in the crop, monitoring, which is where you're looking and you're actually recording numbers and, um, and where you're finding them, and then comparing, so you're, you're looking at what those numbers mean and what they are uh, in contrast to other areas or other, uh, other factors and then sharing that data beyond your farm so you can get a bigger picture of what's going on. And I'll just go through those in a, in a little bit more detail um, now. So the first one is forecasts. Um, and I suspect most of you are familiar with the uh, AHDB BYDV management tool. Um, and this just puts, you could just put in a little bit of data, a bit of information about your crop, and then it predicts um, when you might expect to see uh, aphids arriving in your crop. And that gives you some indication of when you should go out and make, take some observations. And forecasts like this are incredibly useful because they're quite quick to do. Um, relatively quick, you don't need to necessarily go out into the crop um, to, to uh, to generate an answer. Um, so they're the kind of thing that you can be doing quite frequently when when that particular pest is um, expected. Um, so it's kind of low effort, uh, but quite a quick win. And we're going to see a lot more of these kind of tools coming into effect in the, over the next few years, because as agriculture is moving to more of a digital um, age, uh, this is where people we're putting a lot of effort to develop um, systems and uh, and there's also a large project going on at the moment to try and bring all these different systems together um, which is the IPM decisions project um, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of already and um, you'll certainly hear more about in the next uh, in the next few months so once you've uh, got an idea of what pests might be arriving you then need to go out and have a look for yourselves and there's lots of different ways of um, of observing insects uh, you can use pitfall traps and we're doing a lot of pitfall trapping um, on the strategic farms this year and that's a, quite a useful uh, tool because it's a relatively simple thing to do um, you can put any container into the ground you just get it ground level at the top um, and uh, and you cover it so that at least some uh, of the uh, small animals things don't fall in and insects fall into the trap you can then have a look and see what you've caught um, relatively painless process and uh, it, it's quite a good way of collecting quite a lot of uh, information. There are of course other things as well, um, so you can use uh, sweep netting, you can use sticky traps, water traps, or if you get really fancy there's some big malaise traps that catch things that are flying past. Um, all these things take different levels of skill to set up and, and then you've got to try and identify what you've caught. At the observation level uh, that shouldn't be too important and I think if you will take one thing away from today I'd really like it to be that you can have a go at these things and, and the most important thing is to have a go and start to familiarize yourself with the kind of things you're seeing on your farm it doesn't matter if you don't know what the name is because if you keep seeing the same thing as you observe things around your farm you know what that is you know you've got a lot of it you know you don't have many of it and 
if you just put a picture on Twitter or send it to us, we will do our best to let you know what it is. And, and there are plenty of people out there who can help with that. So I really encourage everyone just to have a go at this and, and however you try and find insects, just have a go and see what you can find. Um, just on the next slide, we'll see if this works. This morning, I went into my garden and um, I found some uh, some aphids on my uh, in, on my lawn, and I found this uh, ladybird larvae uh, as well. So it is fairly straightforward to find these things. I know I was looking, knowing what I was looking for, um, but this is they are, they are abundant this time of year. So so do go out and have a look. Um, I also managed to find a hoverfly uh, adult, which hopefully. Richard will play in the next one. Um, so this is an adult hoverfly feeding on a flower, and it's going to go out of focus in a second. But the the really important point is that hoverfly adults uh, are feeding on the flower to get nectar. That's the kind of sugar solution they use uh, to, to to sustain themselves, um, and they're also getting pollen, and pollen gives them the proteins they need to start uh, egg development and reproduction. Um, they don't feed on aphids at all, um, but their larvae do, and their larvae are, are one of the more important um, natural enemies in crops. So the adults need an entirely different food supply to the larvae, and as I'm sure you appreciate, not many crops have many flowers in them. So that's why um, we look to set up floral margins in and around crops, is to provide those extra resources that the hoverfly needs but isn't getting from the cropped area itself. Mark, I've just got a quick question if I can interject yeah. there. Um, where where do you put the traps? As in, like where where in the field, and and how many fields should? What's the kind of the the, the kind of how many fields should you monitor? What's the kind of quantity yeah. there? Um, yeah, really good questions, and um, hopefully I will cover this. So just bear with me on the slides, and that might help a little bit. So in terms of the first uh, that first step of observing things, it really doesn't matter to to a large extent where you're looking. It's really about familiarising yourself and and having a look to see if things are turning up. You're not at that, at that stage. You're not necessarily interested in are these things throughout the crop? Are they in every crop? It's just trying to see if they're on the farm. See if see familiarise yourself and and um, and that. Uh, understand what's going on. When we come to the monitoring stage, that's when it becomes much more important to understand where in the crop you're going to monitor and how frequently um, and in, in which fields. Um, so the kind of traditional way of monitoring in a field is to do this W uh, transect across the field so that that hopefully covers then you've got some field edge, some middle um, and, and everywhere in between. Um, so that when you you want to have sort of 10, 50, maybe 30 different monitoring points in the field, as many as you can really. Um, and what you're trying to achieve is to have confidence that what the numbers you're getting are representative of the whole field and that you're not just looking at one patch that, that might not be the same as the rest of the, what's going on across the whole area. Um, and that's really important because a lot of pests are are very patchy and so at one step you might find that you've got loads of aphids but then you take go 10 meters along and actually there aren't many there um, so you want to do this this w shape across the field um, and and try and make sure you're you're picking out the whole field not just not just the pockets what we're doing on the um on the monitor farms on the uh, strategic farm sorry um is we're setting up two parallel transects so one is uh, close to the field edge, about 10 metres in, and there's another one about 100 metres in. The reason we're doing that rather than the W pattern um, is because we really wanted to look more closely at that question of um, how far into the, into the crop do some of these uh, natural enemies move. And a lot of the research has suggested that after about 80 metres, you see quite a, quite a significant drop off. So that's where we're, we're just looking at the edge and the centre um, to see if we can pick that up uh, in, in any of the work. Um, so in terms of monitoring, um, it's very pest specific in how you how you go about collecting the data. Um, Richard, if I jump to the next slide. So, so I've just done a really quick summary of, of the pests that um, Rob looked out for on his farm. Um, so we've got the slugs, which are best to look at prior to cultivation. We, we did that last year, um, and I'll come to the data we got from that in a moment. Um, and we just used a really simple refuse trap, which is an upturned saucer, uh, plant pot saucer with a bit of um, grain underneath. 
um, and then you just leave that for a few days, come back and count how many slugs are there. So it's it's really straightforward, um, but it takes a bit of time to to, to get around everything. Um, and then cabbage stem flea beetle is really looking at the percentage of area uh, leaf area eaten, um, and you need to look at the um, uh, at the growth stage as well and things like that. I, I won't go through all these in detail, but for each of the different pests, there's a different time that it needs to happen and a different uh, process to collecting the data. Um, some of which take more time than others, some of which there are forecasts available, some aren't. So a lot of the work going on at the moment um, is trying to unify a lot of this and, and try and make it as simple as possible to collect lots of data uh, with as, as little effort and when it's needed as possible. Um, if you want specifics on, on exactly how to monitor specific pests, then by all means get in touch, uh, but there wasn't time to go into that detail just now. Mark, I've got a question from my um, colleague Paul Hill. Um, yeah. Paul says, are we keeping our crops too weed free as more diversity, as, as it would allow for more diversity, encourage more beneficials and possibly divert pests from attacking our crops? Yeah, I mean, there is, there's definitely evidence that suggests that um, where crops have fewer weeds, you get lower insect diversity. Um, it's, it's important to bear in mind, again, what we're trying to achieve when we're um, looking at natural enemies what we're trying to do is increase specific species really of of uh, of natural enemies in the crop um <clears throat> some weeds are quite good at that other weeds are not so it's it's not quite as simple as just letting having more weeds around um although that will be good for insect diversity it's not necessarily going to promote the, the insects that you want to promote um so yeah it, i it, it's kind of a case by case basis but Weeds in the crop is not an answer. It's just, it just may help a little bit. So I've got um, a little bit of data here from the um, slug trapping that we did on the strategic farms last autumn. Um, and this is just a really simple histogram. So along the bottom axis um, is the number of slugs per trap. Um, going from zero, no slugs found at all, right up to over 100 in the trap. Um, and then on the left-hand axis uh, is the number of traps that contain that number of slugs. So for example, if we look at the very first bar on the left-hand side where um, there were no slugs per trap, we found that in, I think about 27 traps had no slugs at all. Um, and there's a, a threshold um, is set to be, I think it's four slugs per trap. Uh, if it's above that, then you should consider um, taking action. Uh, so that's what that red line indicates on the on the chart. And you'll see that the the majority of traps uh, that we checked um, had very low numbers of slugs in them. Um, I think nearly half of them were below the threshold across across all the fields we monitor it, monitored in, and we were monitoring at ten locations per field. Um, the biggest the, the main point I wanted to make here is that if you look uh, over towards the right, you'll see some traps did have an awful lot of slugs. So that means if you um, only check, only put one trap out and you happen to put it somewhere where you end up with 60 slugs turning up in the trap, that's not necessarily representative of what's going on. Um, and it might give you quite a skewed uh, uh, basis on which to carry out treatment. So that's why you need to monitor in multiple locations and really um, compare what you're seeing at any individual location across everywhere else um, certainly across your farm if not within fields across your farm and, and ideally across uh, other farms as well so you can really benchmark what's happening um, but obviously the more comparisons the more data you collect the more time that is to, to get everything together um, so there is a trade-off there as well mark i know rob on the panel's got a question for you so rob i'll hand over to you yep yeah mark we we we're often looking at the level of threshold uh, for the issue, but um, uh, when we're talking about the beneficials, how do we know when there's enough beneficials there to take care of certain problems themselves or um, a sort of a, a threshold for the beneficials as well as pest? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question, and it's it's not one I can answer uh, quickly without um, a whiteboard and and uh, <laughs> lots of coffee. Um, but to put it to put it really quickly, um, what the natural enemies are doing is 
um, reducing the rate of, in, of population growth. That, that's the main impact they're having. So, so yes, they are eating individuals, but the main role that the impact that has is not on the removal of that individual, but it's the removal of the, the reproductive potential of that individual. So when pests uh, increase in abundance, they tend to increase exponentially. Um, and so what the natural enemies do is they slow that growth and, and so they hopefully level off before you get to a threshold for treatment. Um, in order to assess the impact of natural enemies, you therefore not only need to monitor um, pests at a particular time, but you'd need to see the change in pest abundance over time. So you'd need to be monitoring um, fairly regularly to do that. Um, now there's there's good evidence that that, that is the case, um, and I can send you I can circulate some some papers and things like that um, that that show that. Um, but in terms of monitoring it on your farm, the amount of data you'd need to collect um, and, and the way you'd need to analyze it would be quite difficult. Um, so at the moment, there aren't any thresholds out there um, that, that directly look at natural enemies. I suppose what you have uh, to hand, readily to hand, are the, the pest thresholds. And one way you can look at if your natural enemies are, are having an impact is by collecting that data across lots of landscapes and seeing if your pests are not achieving that um, threshold in comparison to other areas where they are going over the top. And if, if you are below the threshold and lots of other people are above the threshold, and what you're doing is, is trying to promote natural enemies, there's a good chance that that's, that's how you've achieved it. Um, so you can kind of do it indirectly like that, but it, it does rely on, again, collecting and sharing data um, really across quite a large area. Okay, that's great, thanks. Mark, I've got a question on the slugs from, from Dave Bell up in, in Scotland. And it just yep. he asks, how is the research relating to slug population related to, to ground type coming along? As in, do slugs tend to move large distances? Um, I'm not directly involved with that, but I know, I mean, obviously soil type and things like that have, have quite a, a large impact on, um, uh, on slug populations. Um, and I know they are finding a lot of uh, lot more out at the moment, but I don't want to comment too much because I, I just haven't been involved in that research. Um, I know that there's a, I think there is an HDB project on it at the moment, um, which which maybe Emily can share some data on. But for the, for for off the top of my head, I can't remember the, uh, what they they're finding at the moment. Do you know if the slug pitfall traps have water in it in them? Um, so we don't use. We don't use the pitfall traps for collecting slugs. We use the um, upturn uh, saucer over grain, and then you're, you're collecting live ones. The pitfall traps are quite good for trying to collect the natural enemies of the slugs, uh, but they're not so good at the slugs themselves. Finally, a question. I'll carry on the slugs, uh, Rob. I've got a question for you, Rob. Have you variable variable rate applied slug control over fields going on soil conditions? going on the soil conductivity and assuming slug populations in those soil types? Um, I haven't. I know uh, some people who have and they think it works quite well. We haven't, at the moment, we we just haven't got the technology with our slug pellet um, application at the moment. We do certainly see differences in soil type um, in the amount of damage from, uh, from slugs. So I certainly think that it is, um, if you've got the technology and the ability to do it with your equipment, um, then we would be doing it definitely, yeah. All right, thanks, both. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done the, the full analysis on the data we collected yet, and, and once we have, we will try and put the soil type against the data and see see where that, uh, see what happens. But um, Richard, if you just jump to the next slide, what I have done very quickly, so this just shows uh, we monitored at three farms. Um, so the two strategic farms and also one of the monitor farms. Um, I've not told you who's who because um, it, it might be a bit unfair at this stage, but certainly we found that one farm had a lot more uh, slugs on it than the others. Um, now that's not necessarily anything to do with the farmer or what they're doing. It might just be because of the timing of uh, when we um, did the trapping or um, or what the crops were and things like that. So um, really what I wanted to show with this slide was just that there you can sort of attribute different uh, variation to the farms, um, but Richard, if you jump to the next slide, if you then look at the variation between fields across those, those farms, you can see that actually there's quite an inf a few fields that, that are markedly different. Um, and then what we can do is we can see how much of the variation in slug abundance 
is uh, attributable to the different um, spatial scales. So if you, if you go click on again, uh, Richard, what we see is that 93% of the variation in slug uh, um, very, uh, abundance is attributable to field. So um, I think the question, there was a question earlier about whether, whether you should be monitoring different fields or different locations within field. My take home message here really is that you do need to be looking at each field individually. Um, and this is something that we've seen not just in slug data, but in, in um, various other uh, data as well. So having a, a kind of one policy across the farm attitude um, is not likely to work very well. And you do need to look at each field and consider what its history was and what's going in and, and what's happening around it, um, because there can be some very local effects happening. Um, so just looking forward to what we're doing um, this year, uh, we've still got some more monitoring to do, there's some more pitfall trap, uh, traps going out uh, this next week, and we're also doing some serial aphid assessments and looking at their natural enemies as well. Um, and there's an opportunity for everyone, uh, anyone to get involved with that, because we're trying to do some really simple methods um, and then trying to build on the sharing idea and learn a bit more about what's going on. Now, I know for, for many of you, serial aphids really aren't a high priority, um, but it's quite an easy one to monitor uh, relatively, and it's something we could be doing over the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you'd like to get involved, there is a, a handout um, associated with this webinar. Um, it's called the AHDB SF Aphid Survey 2020, um, and that would explain uh, what you need to do. It's, it's very simply going into a field and doing two lines of aphid counts on um, on tillers um, and then there's an online survey for you to send me the data. Um, it's not in high detail, it's nothing too strenuous, um, but it will just give us a quick idea of uh, what's going on in different fields across the country. Um, and then we can look into that and, and dig down and see what's going on um, and hopefully build on it in the future. So it, it hopefully will not take you very long. Um, if you have any issues with it, just give me a shout and uh, and, and we can discuss it more. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. Richard, I know we're, we're pushing for time a little bit, so we can go to the last slide. Um, just to really sum up, in terms of developing a monitoring strategy, strategy for your farm, I think the main thing to do is remember that there is this background variation that you're going to see within your farm and between your farm and everyone else's farm. And so in order to know what's going on, it, it really is up to you to go out and have a look. Do use the forecast tools that are out there and there will be more of them coming um, because that will help you a lot in targeting what you need to focus on in the next few weeks. Um, do try and make observations little and often. And this is observations, not recording detailed data. It's having a look and seeing what you've got on your farm and just learning to recognize some of the key players that you have. Um, whether they are best natural enemies or just interesting things around, um, there are plenty of um, entomologists such as myself who will jump at the chance to try and identify a photo you send. So, so just have a go and have a look. Um, once you find something that uh, is, a, is a priority pest for you, then you can start monitoring, um, trying to collect data, record it in a way that is representative of the whole area. Um, and tries to tell you about uh, enough information that gives you confidence in what you should do next and try and compare across your fields uh, and, and share that information so we can all, all benefit from it. Thank you very much. So at this stage we're going to hand over quickly to, to my colleague Emily Pope. Um, Emily works in, in the Arable Knowledge Transfer team. Um, we'll let Mark um, kind of have a, have a, get to have a drink and, um, and grab his breath and I've got a ruck of questions coming in and we'll have a, a quick fire session once um, once we've been through the the HDB tools that and um, for pests and disease, for, for pests. Emily I'll hand over to you there. Thank you Richard um, if you can move on to my first slide please. So Richard um, asked me to do just a bit of an update today um, about the HDB resources that we have available through our website so all of our all, all of our resources are available online um, and there are a number of them that you can order to have um, in a paper copy. So if you just email publications at hdb.org.uk, you will be able to order um, a range of publications and they'll be delivered to your door. So 
For today, I wanted to focus on the key pest pressures that um, Rob has identified on his farm for cereals and oilseed rape. Um, but obviously, as I say, we've got a lot more information about other pests um, on other crops available online. So the main publication uh, that we have is the Encyclopedia of Pests and Natural Enemies. This is a really important publication and includes lots of information across a range of crops um, and pests and natural enemies, including identification, the risk factors, life cycle monitoring, control thresholds, non-chemical controls, and where we know um, about insecticide resistance. A key part of this publication is obviously not only the section on the pests, but also the section on the natural enemies. And we've been talking a lot about them today. And that section includes, again, some of the, that ID information and um, how you can adapt your management systems to promote the numbers uh, of natural enemies on your farm. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> you go back to the slugs one. Um, so HGB has been funding some work looking at integrated slug control and we have the integrated slug control handout that you can download from the website. You can see here, this is just a screenshot of part of that publication um, that just takes you through the methodology that Mark was explaining around how to monitor for slugs um, and then how to, to compare your catch to the district. To, to the different thresholds. Um, I think Dave Bell asked about the um, most recent slug research that we funded. If you just go back a slide, sorry, Richard. Um, and just so everyone else is aware, we've had a PhD student recently who's been working at Harper Adams. That project has now concluded, so the final project report is available online. But that research found that there were significant aggregations of slugs were found at different field sites. But one of the um, kind of one of the next steps for that project was to look at how those aggregations of slugs changed throughout a number of different seasons. And they're going to look at the technology around how you can um, how you can apply molluscicides um, in terms of uh, of management and control of slugs. So if we move on to cabbage stem flea beetle, um, see this is, is a, a key pest and, and it's having a big impact on a number of farms across the country um, and increasingly so. In terms of the, the ongoing research that HDB are part of, we've got a PhD student again at Harper Adams and she's looking at novel approaches to, cabbage, uh, to control cabbage stem flea beetle. So um, Claire's the student there at Harper and uh, you, can, you can find her on Twitter. She's actually been working with both Rob and our Bridge North Monitor Farm, um, Adrian Joyce. She's been collecting samples from both of their farms uh, as part of her project. And she's looking at screening different biopesticides and plant extracts and looking at the efficacy of those products, both against adults and cabbage stem flea beetle larvae. Part of the project is also going to look at how we can use biopesticides in conjunction and in combination with conventional insecticides. So my colleague Fiona Geary, she's currently working with um, Innovative Farmers on a field lab looking at defoliation of winter oilseed rape. And this really has led on from a previously funded project um, working with ADAS looking at IPM for, for cabbage stem flea beetle. So this project has now finished um, and a final report will be published online shortly. But the key messages uh, last year at the final reporting stage or, or the most recent reporting stage of the project um, included things like drilling date and weather as a major risk factor. Uh, they found few benefits of increasing seed rate. They did uh, report on the use of all seed rate volunteers and these can act as a trap crop. And as I said, the defoliation, um, that was shown to reduce cabbage stem flea beetle larval numbers by as much as 55%. So the Innovative Farmers Field Lab is taking that forwards and, and looking at that application on farm. Finally, on cabbage stem flea beetle, I'm really pleased. Um, very recently, we've put out a call for new research um, and we've got uh, a ring fence fund as part of that research call where we'll be running on-farm trials and they'll be located at Rob's farm. So we can specifically link directly with the research project there and, and look at the application of those management strategies on farm. 
So in terms of AFIDs, um, we've got a project looking at the management of aphids and BYDV risk in winter cereals. And this is looking at um, monitoring of aphids and developing decision support systems. So it's going to look at a range of data that we've got available through our different monitoring um, platforms and projects. So looking at suction trap data, it's also going to look at image analysis and looking at some of those infield monitoring techniques that, that Mark mentioned earlier. Hopefully starting this year, but obviously subject to, um, to restrictions, we'll have a PhD looking at the use of trap cropping for aphid pests. So this is looking at using heritage, a heritage wheat variety, Maris Huntsman. In previous work, this has, um, at Harper Adams University, the researchers found that significantly more aphids landed on Maris Huntsman over HDB recommended list varieties. So this has got great potential um, as a use for crap chop. And if we think about the potential to locate it alongside, say, the flowering strips at Rob's farm, um, you can um, target where the aphids are landing close to the location of the, um, of the natural enemies in those flowering strips. I'd encourage you to sign up for AFID News. Um, and you can sign up here, you can see the website available on, on the slides. Um, and you'll receive weekly regional information on AFID species and numbers between April and November. Thank you, Richard. If you just move on to the next slide. Um, so Charlotte Rowley is the crop protection scientist for pests at AHDB. But obviously, if you've got any questions um, or queries, you can get in touch with any of any of us at HDB. I'd encourage you as well, um, Mark mentioned the monitoring and forecasting tools. You can see the range of those tools available at hdb.org.uk forward slash tools. Thank you. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, <clears throat> right. So panel, hold on to your seats. We've got some, some questions to, to go through here and there's, there's a few. First of all, one is one for Rob, and is what seed mix was planted, uh, the main key species, wildflower, wild, wildflowers or grasses? Um, so I couldn't possibly reel it all off off the top of my head. Um, I do believe it's available um, on uh, in one of the handouts. Um, there's certainly things in there. There's some, there's some crimson clover in there. There's some yarrow in there. There's some... Um, uh, oxide daisy, um, a lot of the usual things you find in these um, uh, in these um, uh, margins. Um, the one uh, the one we planted was um, specially put together by us or someone working with the CEH at the time, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, but uh, we've also got other margins which we've planted around the farm, um, not part of this trial, but as a um, uh, as the norm, we, we put a six meter margin around all of our um, arable fields, certainly on the owned land um, that we farm, um, and they're all they're all very similar. But the list is there um, in the um, in the literature somewhere. Emily, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so everyone should be able to access the handout from the side panel, and and yeah, the, the seed mix is in there. Yeah, sorry, I was a very bad chair and didn't mention at the beginning that there's a handout um, section on your on the box on the right hand side of your screen, um, which relates to, to everything that we're talking about today and the work done on the strategic farms. So if you do want to have a look at those, then please, please feel free to do so. It's probably worth mentioning that the, the mixes have established very differently on different soil types. So certain fields of uh, the oxide daisy has just gone absolutely mad. And that was one of the images. Um, 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 that we had at the beginning of the slideshow. Um, on other fields, the crimson clover's done really well. The yarrow is, was a bit sporadic here and there. In some fields, the grass has grown a bit too much that we wanted, and in other fields, it's barely established at all. So really different. So I think it's really important to have that mix, um, that variation in the mix, um, if you're having it all around the farm on different soil types. The other thing to mention is that a lot of the different flowers that inclu are included have different roles in um, in, the, in the margin. Um, so when you're looking to attract natural enemies, a lot of them have quite simple mouth parts. Uh, so they need simple flowers. They're quite shallow flowers where the nectar is quite close to the surface. 
Um, so things like yarrow, coriander, those, those wild carrot, those ones are really good, um, but they're not actually all that good at attracting the, some of the natural enemies to the margin. So that's where the oxide daily, daisy comes in really well. And that kind of brings everything in close and, and gets them visiting. Um, and that's one of the other reasons you want a good mix uh, in your in your flower margin, because as Rob said, they don't all establish in the same way. You do end up with with some uh, some plants dominating in different areas, and um, so you want to have a good mix so that something something comes up. Um, and then the other thing is that that the some of the flowers that you'll have in these mixes won't necessarily be for beneficial uh, natural enemies. So things like clover aren't necessarily all that great for um, things like hoverflies and, and parasitoid wasps, uh, but they are really good for bees, which have these these longer tongues that get deeper into the flower. So that's why clover is often included for in pollinator mixes. Right, Mark, I've got a question for you. It's quite a long one, so I'll try and read it slowly. Here we go. Okay, I might write it down when you're saying. <laughs> I was never very good at reading out loud anyway. Um, I agree with the benefits of IPM. I would rather use no insecticides at all. We are in a BYDB we are in a BYDV area. How effective and what considerations should be given to the different types of pest infestation, for example, controlling damage from direct feeding or physical damage versus, say, transmission BYDV? So, um, well, they're, they're two different uh, different sources of damage i mean in so the bydv which gets brought in by the aphids in the autumn and and um they tend to then over winter uh, and then in the spring they start moving around and, and that's where you get the transmission from plant to plant and you see these patches form um that can have different amounts of damage different impacts on yield depending on the variety um and i off the top of my head i can't remember what the the yield losses are but they they can be quite substantial uh, if you get a, a, a large spread across the field um, so it's certainly one to take very seriously, uh, although the spread of it is quite um, is related to weather conditions. So, so it's one to monitor quite fairly carefully through the, the early spring, particularly. Um, and I do think that the the BYDV tool on the HDB website is is pretty good. So it's worth keeping track of that one. In contrast to the summer feeding, um, you again it does depend a bit on the timing of the crops and and um and when the aphids turn up and the growth stage they're at when they start getting damaged um so it's it's not all that straightforward um but it, it certainly would take an awful lot of aphids that cause significant damage in the summer um, that said when it happens the damage can be substantial so that's why it's worth keeping a track on that most likely if the aphids in the summer have get to a point where they're damaging the crop and damaging yield it's most likely because of a lack of natural enemies um so it's something that you should be looking around the rest of your farm to see see why you have a lack of natural enemies it might might be because you don't have those additional uh, resources around the farm um or it might be uh it might be because there was a lack of food for them earlier in the year but but that'd be what to look at but i'm not sure how, that's directly answered the question but and how effective are the natural enemies against these types of damages um, they definitely are effective in, in terms of they will um, slow population growth and avoid um, uh, thresholds being reached. Um, but how effective they are will depend on on a lot of different circumstances around the field. So um, I would say, on the whole, what is helping to prevent most pests from from achieve, uh, reaching damage levels is usually the natural enemies. So they are playing a huge role. If you are try then try to manipulate them to increase that that role, then um, uh, it's very farm dependent. Thanks, Mark. I've got another one for you here as well. On a year where insect pests seem to be very high and beneficial populations seemingly low, how do we cope with the damage from pests while predators and other best beneficials build up? Okay, so this, this kind of leads on from the other question. So um, one of the problems we have with natural enemies is that there is a lag where the pest has to build up enough for the natural enemies then to arrive, build up their own populations and then respond and, and, and reduce their population growth. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have is that because a lot of agricultural landscapes are quite simple, so they don't have many of these additional resources, 
the natural enemy populations are quite closely linked to the pest population. And, uh, and so you end up with this lag and they, they never quite catch up. And so you often end up with a, um, a pest outbreak that um, you need to then manage. So the idea of, uh, of promoting the natural enemies with um, non-crop ha non habitat um, is to try and um, increase the natural enemy populations while the pest is building up so you, they can respond better. What you're trying to do is, is decouple them a bit so that the natural enemies can build up quicker and so slightly independently of the, the pests. Um, so that, that's why we, we want to put these additional resources around as many of the fields as possible. Um, it's also why putting them in one field isn't necessarily going to be all that beneficial. So what Rob's doing um, uh, on, on the strategic farm where they're putting these margins around every field is much more effective than just putting it on the field where you want to see a response. Um, because you're, you're trying to build us the overall population of natural enemies rather than just trying to boost them in one particular area. What that also means is that it can take some time for the natural enemy populations to build up. It may take a few years for them to get enough um, independence of the, the pests in the crop to actually have a big enough resilient population to respond to pest outbreaks in the future. So it can take three or four years, especially if you've had previously had quite a simple landscape, it can take a few years to build that population up and have that robust um, response ready for when the pests start to build up. Uh, so I'm afraid it's not a simple answer. And it's not as easy as just putting in a field margin and that does the trick. It's about trying to create a landscape that provides um, a, a whole suite of different resources that enables the natural enemies to um, to be there, kind of ready for the pests, rather than always responding to them. Thanks, Mark. You just answered my next question in that. Um, how long does a trap need to be down for? Are we talking a day, a, overnight, um, a few days? What What do you think? Again, really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, so the pitfall traps, you can put them in just overnight. You pr probably won't catch very much, um, but you can just put them in overnight. If you're leaving them more than overnight, then you need to put in something that will preserve them. So a uh, salt solution is the easiest thing to do. Um, otherwise, they, they fall in and they tend to eat each other, which, which doesn't help very much. So um, you can leave overnight, you can leave them a few days. You probably wouldn't want, wouldn't want to leave any trap more than five or six days, um, a week at max, just because they start to deteriorate a bit, they start to eat them, or you get a rain, uh, rainy spell and they flood and, and you lose everything. So probably three or four days is, is about right. Uh, next was more of a comment, Mark, but just to see if you've got anything to say on it. Mm. If in the not too distant future, the monitoring of numbers of beneficials does become possible on every bit of land in the field and in the margins, then work needs to be done to determine the beneficial thresholds now. Do you agree? Um, yes and no. I mean, there is some work that, that is already out there that we could build on to, to get an idea of that. Um, one of the difficulties is that you don't necessarily know which beneficial is going to be the one that has the effect in that year. So you know, you, if you're looking and you, you say, well, I haven't got any hoverfly larvae on my crop, it might be because there's ladybird larvae doing the job, or it might be that parasites are doing the job. You don't, you don't necessarily see all of them at the same time. So there, there is no simple threshold that is going to, going to be really effective. It, it's much more dynamic than that. Um, I do agree that, that it would be good to start to get ahead of it and, and widespread, widespread monitoring um, would be really good and it, it's probably going to become easier in the future um, when there are more tools available to, to, to capture that data. Um, but uh, exactly where we would start is, is quite a big question, I think. Mark, is there a, do you know of a drone camera that could assess um, slope pressure, i.e. the thermal or the, the moisture? I'm not aware of any. Um, that doesn't mean people aren't developing things in the background. Uh, they're most likely going to be looking at uh, associated factors rather than, than actual slug numbers, particularly because slugs um, can go quite deep into the soil. So there's, I don't see how you could really pick up those sort of that sort of data with a drone, but associated uh, data might be possible. Right, Mark, I'll give you a break for one question and go go to Rob. <laughs> uh, Rob, would you have some idea on how much you need to increase your margin per tonne financially 
to compensate for the, the land used for the infield strips? Um, it's, it's not something we've run numbers on yet because we've only done the infield strips in, in, in one small field. The, the impact is, is, is marginal at the moment. Um, I think if it were, if there was some very, really valuable information and data come out of this in the next four or five years to say that there is a, um, a real benefit of doing it, then I think, yeah, certainly at some point you'd need to um, obviously assess the amount of land you're going to lose in cropping. The benefit of doing the exterior margins is obviously that um, you're taking out usually taking out bits of land that are less productive anyway um, but yeah it's definitely a consideration within field margins that you may well be uh, removing some um, really good land from your from your arable crops um, so i think yeah i think if the data is there to prove that it works and it wants rolling out on a um, on a farm scale um, then i think there's definitely work that needs to be done on on, on the margin how long are you going to leave them down in your field rob well, like I say, we'll see how, what the data comes back over the um, over the next four or five years for the strategic farm. When we get to the end of that, hopefully we'll have some some really, really good numbers and that'll help me make the decision on whether we leave those in, whether we roll it out to more fields, whether it's specific areas or specific farms that we know we've got issues on um, and that we need to look at doing more of this um, more of this in field but I think um, yeah let's see what data we get back over the next four or five years. Mark we'll come back to you um, how crucial do you think it is that we link the margins across the farm and the landscape so that beneficials can move around the site if conditions or food sources become unsuitable? Yeah so that's that's really important because what you want is a nice um, robust uh, population across your whole farm and that's able to move when when resources are moving around as well um, particularly because a lot of the natural enemies uh, that are beneficial for one crop can then move into another crop later on so things like the the ladybirds for example anything that eats aphids they don't really mind which aphids they're eating so if they're doing a job in the cereals obviously when the, the cereal crop um, senesces the aphids disappear those natural enemies need somewhere to move on to uh, and if you have a later crop, so potatoes, for example, the natural enemies can move into that crop, but that relies on them being able to move across the landscape um, from field to field and, and potentially further. Um, in terms of, of how they do that, it, it's slightly more complicated. Some, uh, I mean, certainly hoverfly adults are more than capable of traveling a few kilometers um, on, on on their own behalf um, and, and other things as well. Uh, so there is a certain amount of, of migration possible anyway, um, but it's really about making sure that the resources are are around when they get there as well. Uh, and that's that's why it's really important not to just put things in one field, but to spread it across the farm so that you do get this, this transition, transition across when it's needed. Mark, is bare ground good for certain, certain beneficials like the um, ground beetles? Uh, um, I'm not so sure it's necessarily good, but it, it provides a different habitat and a different um, different ecology. So you would get different species come up. Um, so for, there are some species that do like a bit of bare ground. It's more about disturbed ground than, than bare ground necessarily. Um, but um, yeah, so it, I mean, really, any different habitat you've got in your farm is, is going to have different benefits for different things. Um, so it, it, yeah, there's there's no there's no simple single habitat that's going to solve all the problems. Uh, Rob, how do you manage the firing strips? Um, do you top them in the winter? Um, so no, not in the winter. What we um, what we've had to try and do for the first uh, for the first year, so for the first spring and summer we mow them quite hard so that the grass doesn't get too well established and it leaves a bit of room for the flowers to come through. Um, we've done that quite successfully on some margins. Um, there are others on some pretty fertile ground where the, the grass is probably a bit too thick um, than we would ideally want. Um, and then, yeah, certainly for the first two years, it's it's about mowing them quite hard through the through the early spring and then late in the summer again. Um, and then, uh, sort of, hopefully, year three, four, five, and beyond. Um, that's when we just start regular mowing. Um, 
in the uh, in the spring and early summer. Ideally, we're being asked to remove um, the cuttings. It's it's quite difficult for us to do. It's obviously easier to do if you're in a livestock situation and you've got um, access to machinery to cut and row and bale and or, or forage or whatever it may be. Um, so at the moment, the sort of the the second best situation is to mow it hard when it's dry um, in order to um, chop up the residue really fine, hopefully let the, the heat and the sun do the work and breaking it up and breaking it down um, so that um, it doesn't create mat in the bottom of the margin. That's what we want to avoid to do. Mark, as well as the predator effects on pest insects, presumably there are also beneficial seed eating insects. Can you comment on any benefit from ground beetles eating black grass seeds? I mean, yeah, there are there are several different um, beetles and things that will uh, take away your seeds, and it has been shown to be a benefit. Um, although. Off the top of my head, I don't think they're particularly good with black grass, but I, I'd, I'd have to double check on that. Thanks, Mark. And is there a natural beneficial that kills slugs? Yeah, there's a few. Um, there's there's quite a few uh, beetles that do it. There's, um, yeah, I think it's mainly mainly beetles are the ones that that have an effect. Um, there's some quite ferocious little guys that all take on a slug. Mark, what's your view on hedge, hedgerows? Um, they're they're kind of benefit for diversity in in some respects, but do you think they're an, an obstacle for for some or other beneficials? Um, they definitely have a benefit because, as well as providing the floral resources, you also need to make sure that the beneficial insects have somewhere to spend the winter, and quite a lot of them use the bottoms of of hedgerows. Um, not to mention that a lot of hedgerows also have floral resources as well. Um, there is some evidence that uh, sometimes the hedgerows can act as a barrier to migration, uh, so the, the beneficials will, will move along the barrier rather than going over the top. Um, although I think that the hedgerow overall would have much more benefit than than problem uh, in that respect. So overall, hedgerows are are generally a good thing for for beneficials. Right. Thank you very much um, for for that, and, and you can breathe now, Mark. Um, well, well done. It's not. It must be quite unnerving having all these questions fired at you from every direction, and you can't see what's That's coming. Right. <laughs> um, Mark, um, we're just going to hand, hand over to, to Rob. To, my final question is to, is to Rob, really, and kind of what are the kind of key messages and take homes from from this discussion today for, for you, Rob? Um, and then and then I'll, then I'll do then I'll do a rounding up. Rob, over to you. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think my emphasis needs to be more on the on the monitoring side of things. Like I say, we are. I am out there um, nearly every day walking crops, particularly when the weather's nicer. Um, but yeah, I think I need to get a better idea of, um, of the numbers of not only the pests, but also keeping a real eye on the on the numbers of the beneficials as well. The decision to treat is not often, um, or is often not only because of, 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 of the issue you see there, um, but, but also the level of beneficials and the level of control that we think we may or may not have from that spray. There's no point trying to chuck some insecticide on if you think it's only going to be 20% effective on the, um, on the insect issue that you've got in front of you, and actually you're going to do more harm to the beneficials that are there as well. So, yeah, so for me, it's, it's, it's monitor, 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 you know, um, have a good look at what's there, both the issue you're facing, but also keep a really good eye on the beneficials and what they may be able to um, help you with. Thank you, Rob. Right, all that leaves me to do is to, to conclude this webinar. We've had some fantastic discussion there. Um, hats off to, to Rob and, and Mark for kind of taking, fielding all those kind of questions coming on from every angle. Um, it's, it's not the easiest thing, thing to do. And um, and um, yeah, well done to you both. We had some fantastic discussion. So Strategic Farm Week 2020, we are in uh, day two, Tuesday of, of the week. Um, there's plenty to do as, as the week continues. You can um, you can watch all the research videos which have been recorded and on the Strategic Farm webpage, which is, which is at the bottom of your of the screen there. You can take part in more webinars. The the Thursday's offering of, of webinars are uh, nine o'clock in the morning. We've got 
um, crop establishment considerations with Jane Rickson from Cranfield and Rob Fox on the, on, on the um, webinar today now. Um, at 12 o'clock, we've got soil structure and earthworm assessments um, with Anne Vogel and, um, from ADAS and David Agden, who's the new Scottish um, strategic farmer. And then finally in the evening at seven o'clock, we've got a, a mould drainage um, masterclass and soil restructuring. And that's with, um, with an old favourite, Philip Wright, who's an independent soil specialist from, um, from Lincolnshire and, and Brian Barker, Strategic Farm East host. Um, there's also lots of, um, the, on, on there'll be the podcast on Wednesday, as I mentioned, that's, um, that's, got, that's got Paul Temple, our chairman of AHDB Serials. Um, he's interviewing the, um, the Strategic Farm host altogether. It makes an excellent listening. Please, please do tune into that. And, uh, and then finally on Friday, we'll release all the handouts and all the, all the kind of resources and, and all the videos. It all can be packaged together on Friday and a, and a closing from our, from our uh, um, sector director, uh, Martin Grantley-Smith. Coming up, aside to all this, this, there's a lot of hype around this week, but there's there's a lot of other things bubbling on. Obviously, our world's, world's been kind of turned upside down, would usually be stood in a field of plot, um, plot tours um, right now. And um, and um, we, we've had that taken away from us from the current circumstances. So there's lots of different regional webinars going on. Keep an eye on on what, what we're doing. Um, there's lots of different variations and kind of bringing that regional touch that you know and love about the HDB monitor farms and, and regional network. Um, into into an online format. Just today's been a real example of how you can have some great discussion um, in through using this medium. There's also a couple of recommended list webinars. Um, there'll be um, I think it's labelled variety is the spice of life, and we'll be looking at um, wheat in one, um, barley and rape in, in another. And finally, tomorrow tomorrow evening, um, looking aside possibly from all the kind of the, the kind of crop talk, um, we've got a a webinar. Um, labeled farming today and how are you coping um and it's it's a bit a bit of a kind of a different one we're going to be looking at all the kind of stresses and strains that kind of are, are placed upon upon farming at the moment and and how do you manage those how do you how do you let them not let them affect your life and your your daily working place uh, so that's tomorrow tomorrow night i'll be hosting that with martin williams who's who's an ex hereford monitor farmer and uh becky leach who who um works at kite consulting um, so tune if you want to tune into that, then then please feel free to to register. All that leaves me to do is to thank once again our our host today, Emily, Mark, and Rob. Um, it's a new world that we enter with all with webinars and online meetings, and we're just finding our feet. I think they've done a fantastic job today. And finally, I want to thank you all for for coming along and for for ensuring that we had some fantastic discussion as we went through. It makes it a lot more live, a lot more real, and a lot more more enjoyable to do. So thanks very much and make sure you get the most out of this week. See you all soon. Thanks.